So this is our first lecture in heat transfer. This is our textbook that we're using. We're using the 8th edition. I know there is 7th edition, 6th edition, other editions out there. Get the 8th edition. Bottom line, you'll know what's in the book and what we're covering. Did the topic of heat transfer change that much between editions? No. A lot of the chapters are the same, but problem sets have been changed or problem numbers. Here are the two ISBN numbers that will match and you will get the Wiley Plus included. Otherwise, buy the Wiley Plus separate. So chapter one is an important chapter. Uh, a lot of times a student will ask me questions and maybe after they pass this class and you know what, if we just go back to chapter one, you, you typically find a lot of uh, answers to difficult questions in something like chapter one. So let's just go through it. Uh, we are going to have a review of the three modes of heat transfer. Maybe you've already been exposed to them, conduction, convection, thermal radiation. Look at the rate equations, the unique Fourier's law, Newton's law of cooling, Stefan Boltzmann law. Those describe how, you know, numerically or quantitatively the rate of heat transfer. And then we'll be briefly introduced to, I think I'm going to skip this one though. Uh, we'll get, we'll build on the resistor concept in later chapters. Uh, we want to put this class in context to a previous class that you passed and mastered called thermodynamics because of notation. What's Q in this class isn't Q in that class. It's, it's, it's slightly different. And so I make that comparison. You should all be experts in units and dimensions. And if not, become experts. And you should all be experts in setting up and solving problems. If not, take a look at it. This isn't the type of material in a... In a physics or a statics or a dynamics type of class. Just go back and pay attention to the fundamentals. And uh, heat transfer is all over. Do the CEs, civil engineers, do they take a heat transfer class? No. Do the double E's? No. But a lot of civil projects need something like that or understanding heat transfer as well as electronics and electrical engineering. So often you'll be paired up. And if you're a mechanical engineer, it's kind of like on your shoulders to carry the load if there's some heat transfer calculations needed. All right, so what is heat transfer? It's pretty straightforward. It's energy being transferred by virtue of a temperature difference. So you have to have something that's, let's say, hot and the location where it's cold and they're in communication, some sort of pathway between, and then you have the transfer of energy. So it's driven by temperature difference from hot to cold. It can't be from cold to hot. If it was from cold to hot, the cold would get colder and the hot would get hotter and you'd have a perpetual motion machine. It would violate the second law of thermodynamics. So it's usually from here to there, some location where it's hot, some location where it's cold and something in between, a region or boundary between so what is temperature? This one's a tough, tough, tough question. It's like, what is time? Time, T-I-M-E. We all use time. It's like, hey, this class started at what time? 11.30. Uh, well, you've been celebrating birthdays for a long time, right? Birthday parties, I love them, right? So time, but to quantitatively define it is very difficult. And as an engineer, we just assume that you can work with time. The same thing is with temperature. But if you really want to, to, to uh, define time, I'd say go talk to a physicist. If you really want a detailed definition of temperature, go talk to a physicist. And then after, I don't know, however long they're going to take to explain it to you, I don't know if you'll walk away satisfied or frustrated. But there's no simple answer for what is time and what is temperature. It really is pretty challenging. Okay, so anyway, it's a measure of how hot something is or how cold something is. Good enough for mechanical engineering. Mm -hmm. Move on. <laughs> I know how to measure it. I know how to use it. And uh, it basically is linked to the molecular energy, the extra energy at the molecular level of our substance. Now, how about a solid? It's not flying around. It's wiggling back and forth and vibrating. Yeah, yeah, there you go. But for a gas, it's, it's for a monoatomic ideal gas, it's in the kinetic energy of the molecules. 
but then they get more complex. It goes to the translational, I mean the rotational and the vibrational energy of those molecules as well. Modes of heat transfer. You've been in classes 6th grade, 8th grade, ninth grade. You've heard of conduction, convection, thermal radiation. You have. So we're going to just review these three modes. Is there a fourth mode? Is there a fifth mode? Is there a seventeenth mode? No, basically boils down to three. Now, within the conduction or convection, you may have a lot of subsets, especially in convection. You may have boiling condensation as part of convection, but it's really convection where you have, and we're going to now talk about each of those. So conduction. Here's kind of a walkthrough of the topic of conduction. Uh, you have a material, material can be solid, liquid, gas, just some material. Some region is hot, some region is cold. It's easiest to start off with one dimensional, 1D problem, one dimensional problem. Well, what does that look like? It looks like a slab. And over here, maybe the temperature is uh, low at T2, the temperature of this base of the slab. And the temperature at this space of the slab, maybe T1 is high. Maybe it's hot, T1. So what we do is we think of introducing a coordinate system. Do you want to call it X, Y, or Z? X. There you go. Professor, why did you even ask me a simple question like that? I don't know to wake you up. I saw you're drifting. So anyway, X. And X is going to start, do you want to start it at negative L, zero, or positive L? Well, let's start it at zero. That makes sense. All right. And then it goes over, increasing, 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 until it gets to the other edge of my slab. What do you want to call that one? Um, negative L, zero, or positive L over here at this other? Positive L. You call it. See, you guys got it all figured out. Zero to L. What's the thickness on my slab? L. Got it. Now, we have this y-axis. We might as well do something with the y-axis. Let's plot temperature on the y. And so if it's further up, that means it's hotter. Let's put T1 here. And if it's lower down, that's T2, then it's a lower temperature, right? So that's T2. And if it's steady heat transfer through it, well, that's supposed to be a straight line. Let me try again. There. So what's that? It's showing you the temperature at every location x between 0 and L. At x equal to 0, it's T1. At x equal to L, it's T2. You know, there is a thing called the slope of that line, the slope. That slope would be like dt dx. Hey, that's why you took calculus, master of derivatives, of functions. Okay, so dt dx. Looking at that, is dt dx 0 equal to 0 for this problem? Is it positive or negative? <laughs> negative. Yeah. All right. Let's take a look now at how we describe the flow of heat from the hot to the cold. All right, we're going to have a symbol Q. Maybe I should put it in black, you know, like there, Q. So, Fourier's law gives us a way of quantifying the rate of heat transfer through my slab. And this is the equation, a negative sign. You watch me long enough and I'll forget that negative sign. K, a property of the material called the thermal conductivity. A, ah, I forgot what A stands for. What does A stand for? Area, area that the heat is flowing through perpendicular to the direction of the flow of heat. And then we had dt dx. Oh, what was dt dx again? Temperature gradient. Temperature gradient. Now, we look at this term. We just talked about dt dx. Was that positive or negative for this problem? It's a negative. So if I put the negative here and I multiply by a negative quantity, what's Q equal to? A uh, positive, meaning that Q often those or sometimes they'll put a little like this saying in the direction of X, in the direction of X, Q in the direction of X is positive. 
Did you know that the math will work itself out if you now take Fourier's law and have a slab where the temperature gradient's like this? The signs will work out, and then the Qx will be negative 5 watts or 50 watts or whatever number quantify that you get, indicating it's not in the positive x direction but in the negative x. The sign will work. Okay, so now we have this area, the thermal conductivity. Okay, let me do this. What would be the typical SI units for area? That's the easiest. SI units for area. Meter squared. All right. What would be the SI units for the temperature change divided by the distance, this gradient? Wouldn't it be something like degree C or Kelvin per meter? Isn't that units for dt dx? How is my temperature changing? Oh, it's going down 5 degrees C per what? X meter distance. True? So it's degree C per length. Degree C per meter. All right. And then this one, what is Q? I forgot. What is Q? Q. It's our rate of heat transfer. What would be our good units for Q? It's a rate of heat transfer, watts, or joule per second, which is a watt. Now, if we look at this, does this equation have to be dimensionally consistent? Yes. You bet it does. Can you figure out what are the units of K for me? What are the SI, typical units of K? I'm going to pause, and I'm going to walk around. On your paper. So a lot of you figured it out. You figured out that it's got to be watts per meter degree C. That's the units for the K, isn't it? Watts per meter degree C. True. Very good. So now we have this property known as the thermal conductivity. Uh, if I have a different material in here, that's what changes. The material property changes the conductivity changes. I could have a slab of glass. I could have a slab of wood. I could have a slab of steel. I could have a slab of air or water. And what we have to do is with the liquid or the gas is no bulk motion, no bulk motion. We're going to get convection in a minute. That's when you get bulk fluid motion. Okay. So it's stagnant air or stagnant liquid. Okay. Okay, now somebody says, I like to talk about a heat flux. Well, what they do is they take this area in Fourier's law and they divide over. So this Q divided by area, hey, what would be the SI units of Q divided by area, my heat flux? Watts per meter squared. Okay, so when you see this term flux, that's what they're really doing is they're normalizing per unit area. And uh, sometimes they'll write that as a Q double prime. Sometimes. I like to write it as Q double prime. See, so it'd be watts per unit length per unit length. So that gives me per unit area. Okay. So sometimes I'll write it as a flux. What do I sometimes forget? I sometimes forget that minus sign. Okay, so be careful of the minus sign. Always think, does the heat flow from hot, higher temperature to cold? Yes. I need to keep that minus sign and not forget it. Okay. Uh, this area sometimes, there's about 1% of the students will get confused as to what is this area. And they'll sometimes say, well, if, if this is my height H and this is L, is the area equal to H times L for this problem? No, it is not. It's the area perpendicular to the flow of heat, isn't it? So if I would have to try and draw this in 3D, I know it's hard for a slab, and it would be something like the height H as I've drawn it. Here, let me try and clean it up a little bit. H going up this way with the W going back. Wouldn't the area be H times W? Nothing to do with L. Right? 
tolerant. Only a few students will struggle with that, but I try to cover it, hopefully, to get the right area. It's perpendicular to the flow of heat. All right, let's move on. Oh, we have a clicker question, but I don't have my clickers working. So do you want to do it the old-fashioned way? I'd take my long, bony finger, and I'd point it in the face of some student and say, you're the lucky one. Give me your answer. <laughs> as long as you point at my friend. All right, so the SI units associated with thermal conductivity are? D. D. Very good. Try this one, or let's take a look at this. We have uh, thermal conductivity, that symbol K for the, the thermal conductivity. They say the units are watts per meter degree C. That look okay? Yeah, that looks good. And here is copper, aluminum, stainless, carbon, steel, and iron. All right. Uh, what's top dog? What has a high K? Copper. It's expensive material. They used to build a lot of uh, radiators out of copper alloy brass, right? And if you had one, you could take it down and salvage it, make some good money salvaging it, turning it in, or they have a lot of theft of copper wire for turning in surplus material, good cash, as well as uh, copper uh, tubing on uh, plumbing. Plumbing. Neben would go into new homes and rip it all out and steal it. That was a problem. There's probably, probably still is. Copper is expensive. We should know that. But anyway, it's also very high conductivity. Very, and, but how does it change from room temperature as I get hotter and hotter? Is there much of a change or is it pretty... Pretty constant. Pretty constant. It's not much of a change. But you may have to know the temperature of my material as well as what the material is to get the K, the thermal conductivity. Some, they're not very strongly dependent on temperature. Some are a little more dependent on temperature. Aluminum, very high. If I had to round off the value of copper conductivity, what would it be? 400. Cut it in half and I have 200. Guess what aluminum is? And when copper got expensive, they moved to aluminum radiators. And it was pretty good, pretty good material, right? They don't move to iron radiators that I know of. They just don't. I mean, you want to promote heat transfer. Minimum temperature difference, a lot of rate of heat transfer in your radiator and automobile, you use aluminum. Okay, so there you go. Now, it's slightly more temperature dependent, isn't it? And the K goes up with temperature. How about stainless steel? It's a lot lower K. How about low carbon steel? Well, it's higher than stainless. Hey, isn't steel steel? No, nope. kind of have to know what it is. And what about this one? It's actually going down with increasing temperature slightly. So there's no rule that says it always goes up with temperature, always goes down with temperature, or it's strongly a function of temperature. Here's one where it's iron is more uh, strongly a function of temperature, and it's going down. So here's some representative values. You can get the K for gases, liquids, all kinds of materials in the back of the book. Next, we went from conduction, we go to convection. So when we have convection, you have to have a solid, and then you have to have basically flowing over the solid fluid. The fluid can be gas or liquid. It doesn't matter. And the solid doesn't have to be always hot. I'm going to show it as being hot. I'm going to say it's a hot solid, and I have a cool fluid flowing over it. In that case, what is the direction of the heat transfer? Q is going to be from the hot solid surface into the flowing fluid. So that's the direction of heat transfer. From our fluid mechanics, we studied flow of fluids over solids, and I'm glad we had that class. We passed the class called fluid mechanics because we studied boundary layers ad nauseum. And we talked about we have this velocity profile. So as a function of y, Going from zero off into the fluid far away, the velocity profile does something like that, where u is a function of y. u is that velocity along the surface, like that. And so far away, it's u infinity, u infinity. And at the surface, 
u at y equal to zero is zero. They call that the no-slip boundary condition. So a little review of fluid mechanics. We add the complexity of heat transfer, so I'm going to shift it over. And here, I'm still going to talk about as a function of y going off from the surface y equal to zero off into infinity and deep into the fluid. But we're going to plot not u that way. We're going to plot t, t, temperature. And so the further I am from here over, the greater the temperature. So what we'll do is we'll say this is the temperature of the surface. We said that was, for our example, going to be hot. You just turn it around. It could be cold with the hot fluid. Same equation works. And then right here would be the temperature of the fluid far away, T infinity. And lo and behold, you get a boundary layer profile temperature like that. It, you know, it's shaped. It's got a little slope to it like that. And it really depends on... Do I have laminar flow or turbulent flow? Do I have flow with a high thermal conductivity or low thermal conductivity? It depend, That will um, affect how deeply into the fluid the temperature effect of that surface is felt. Basically a thermal boundary layer just like you had a velocity boundary layer. But we're getting a little ahead of ourselves because it boils down to a very simple equation the rate equation for convection is called Newton's law of cooling. Q is equal to H A T S minus T infinity. All right, let's make sure we understand each term. This rate of cooling or Newton's law of cooling, because Newton did so much, a lot of people are like, yeah, just call it the law of cooling, convection law of cooling, and leave Newton out of it. So about half the books don't even say Newton's law of cooling, okay? But let's take a look at it. What is Q, Q again? The rate of convective heat transfer. I tried to show it right here in our illustration. What would be the typical SI unit for that Q? Watts. All right, what about each of these temperatures? Degrees C, degrees C. So, you know, the surface temperature minus the fluid free stream temperature, far away temperature. So the, this is a temperature difference. What is the SI units of a temperature difference? Degree C. I mean, degree C minus degree C has units of degree C. All right. What about area? Meter squared. Can you tell me the SI units for H? I think I have a clicker question. What are the SI units associated with a convection coefficient? So what would they be? Be watts per meter squared degree C. And that works it out. So it's dimensionally consistent. Now, that sure to look close to the units for thermal conductivity. So H and K have very similar units. What's the difference? per meter squared. You watch me. I'll mess up on that negative sign on Fourier's law, and I'll mess up on the units of K or H. So watch me carefully as we go through the semester so that I keep it straight. At some point, memorization is good. It's probably good just to say, you know what, I think I'm going to go ahead and memorize the units of K, the units of H, and get them straight in my mind. That may help you. All right, what happens if you take the Q and you divide by the area? What do you get? A heat flux. Sometimes put Q double prime. Watts per meter squared. Is there a minus sign? None. No minus sign needed. The area is perpendicular to the flow of the heat transfer. So all I'm doing is a length of a line right here. Then you have to get the dimension into the page, and then that gives you the area. And then this is a rate of heat transfer, joules per second or watts. All right, let's press forward. What are some typical values of the convection coefficient? So what are some H values? Hey, are these units look okay, or is there a typo here? Is there a typo there? Nope, looks good to me. It is good. All right. 
So if you have free or forced convection or you have boiling or condensation. So this term free is used a lot. It's probably easier to talk about forced convection. I have a fan to blow the air or I have a pump to move the liquid. And then it's forced to flow, to promote the flow. Make it turbulent. Often turbulent flow chews up that boundary layer, promotes the heat transfer. So you have pretty good H's for the forced convection. Air is not as good as water at promoting heat transfer, so it has a lower H range. Notice 25 to 250 versus 500 to 3,000. Now, free convection, there's no fan, there's no pump. It's basically buoyancy-driven flow. Hot air rises, cold air sinks, and you get the flow like that. So buoyancy-driven flow. Notice if I just look at the air values, forced versus free convection, a lot lower, what you would expect. Likewise, for the water, free convection and water, a lot lower convection coefficients. Now, you may think this table is a little silly, but believe me, I go back to it often, or a table like this in another book. Why? Because somebody will do some calculation and say, yeah, I have uh, uh, air as my working fluid, okay? And I have predicted that the H is uh, 500 watts per meter squared degree C, okay? And you have natural convection, buoyancy, yeah, that's what I got. Well, does 500 fall in this range for free convection and air? At that point, I would encourage somebody to go back and look, check their calculations because they may be off. It doesn't seem reasonable. It's like somebody, one time I gave a question and I said, uh, how, uh, how many uh, uh, kilos is, uh, is, 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 you, is a typical human you know, or male uh, in, that's 20 years old in the United States or something like that? And they came back with, I don't know, 9,000 kilos. 9,000 kilograms. You're like, I think we may have something wrong here. Let's just go. You can do the same thing in heat transfer. You can go and check and see if these numbers are reasonable often because if they go outside of this range, then something's wrong. And the highest is when you have boiling and condensation. That is considered in convection. You have a solid surface. You have a fluid over it. Yeah, you have now some really complicated fluid mechanics because some of the boiling is what's happening is it turns to vapor and bubbles come off. But that really promotes a high rate of heat transfer from the surface. Okay, somebody says uh, the H is 10 watts per meter squared Kelvin. What? But they want it in watts per meter squared degree C. Can you do that conversion for me? Can you give me the H in watts per meter squared degree C when this is the answer in watts per meter squared Kelvin? And I need it to three significant digits. I'm going to pause, walk around. I want to see your work, and I want to see your answer, please. So... It goes back to how I use H. I use H by plugging it, say H times A times delta T, and then that gives me Q. So do I take H times A times T to get Q, or is it this? Professor, they have the same units. This T may be a degree C. This delta T is in degree C too. True. Okay, but this is a temperature difference. So you multiply by a temperature difference between the hot surface and the cold fluid. That's what promotes the, the heat transfer. So the fluid could be 300 degrees C and 300 degrees C, or it could be 50 degrees C. That's a bad looking 50. Let me try it again. 50 degrees C and 50 degrees C. What's the delta T? Zero, zero. The T is much different. So anyway, uh, this is 10 watts per meter squared degree C. So this is what I wanted you to show me on your paper. A lot of you did. I wanted an equal sign. I wanted an H. And I wanted a numeric value with units inside of a box. Dear professor, is my answer. How come I don't see 
a different answer. How come? I remember the temperature in degree C, I would add 273, and that would give me the temperature in Kelvin. Not degree Kelvin, just Kelvin. Isn't this equation right? Yeah, but this is changing from a relative to an absolute temperature scale. What we're really interested in is a temperature difference. To multiply by the H. Yeah. And one degree C temperature difference is equal to one Kelvin temperature difference. That's the important equation. This is also true, but it's this one's for temperature difference, and this is for a change between the relative and the absolute temperature scale. Got it. So, the next one we talk about is thermal radiation. You could think of electromagnetic waves or packets or photons, little packets of energy. And they travel through either a vacuum or through transparent gas. In this room, we do have gas, it's air, but it's fairly transparent to the thermal radiation, not perfectly but it's fairly transparent, okay? But if you have a vacuum, you could still have photons traveling through the vacuum. So if you have the surface of the sun and our little planet called Earth, what is the majority of the material between the surface of the sun and the planet Earth? What's out there in space? A lot of nitrogen? A lot of air? Vacuum, vacuum, vacuum. Pretty good vacuum, in fact. So that's how photons are just going right through the vacuum. Don't need a material to go through. So <clears throat> the uh, rate equation is known as the Stefan-Boltzmann law. And this is the Stefan-Boltzmann law. Q is equal to um, sigma A T to the fourth. All right. Okay, let's see, I've got one, two, three, four terms to deal with to try and figure this equation out. Probably Q may be one of the easiest. What is Q in this equation? Watts. It's a rate of heat transfer in units of watts. All right, I'm going to skip sigma. How about area? Oops, I'm sorry, A. It's area. I gave away the answer, didn't I? What would be the typical SI units for the area? Meter squared, all right. Now, T, that may be easier than sigma. So let's try and tackle this T. What do you think T is for? Temperature. Okay, what's the temperature at which ice is uh, in atmospheric pressure, ice? Zero degrees C. So if I put in zero degrees C to the fourth power, zero to the zero, but you know what? It's still pretty warm compared to cryogenic temperatures. This equation works in cryogenic temperatures. So what do you think about the temperature? Should I be able to put in degree C, or should I be forced to put in absolute temperature scale in Kelvin? Kelvin only. Kelvin only. And now when you take it to the fourth power, you're basically getting that Kelvin to the fourth power. There's very few things in engineering that are to the fourth power. That's huge. So as temperature goes up, T to the fourth goes up very rapidly. Very, very rapidly. All right. Now we could figure out the SI units on this property. Well, it's this constant. It's called the Stefan-Boltzmann constant. Basically, a guy named Last Dave Stefan and by with Boltzmann were figuring this out about the same time period. They don't want to give Stefan 100% of the credit and Boltzmann none. They don't want to give Boltzmann all the credit and Stefan none. So they basically said, hey, the Stefan Boltzmann equation, the Stefan Boltzmann constant. So this is the symbol we use in our textbook, sigma. It's 5.67 with some more digits. Don't think that it stops there, but I always stop it there. And the vast majority of engineering calculations stop it there. Times 10 to the minus 8 watts per meter squared Kelvin to the fourth. Do the units work? Yeah. 
Again, 5.67, blah, 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 more digits out there if you want them, times 10 to the minus 8 watts per meter squared Kelvin to the 4th. This is what I would call the pure Stefan Boltzmann law. It's for a perfect surface that's emitting photons off of it. It's for the black surface. I know black is a funny name for a perfect emitter, but it's a perfect emitter. Well, are, are all of our surfaces perfect? No. We have some real surfaces, and they modify the Stefan Boltzmann law by saying Q is equal to epsilon times sigma times A times T to the fourth. What? What do you mean, epsilon? That's our emissivity. Okay. So if we already worked out the SI units of Q and sigma and A and temperature, and now I come in with a new equation where I multiply in, here's epsilon. Can you figure out the SI units of epsilon, the emissivity? Dimensionless. Dimensionless. And this value of epsilon ranges between 100% and very close to zero. I wouldn't say it goes all the way to zero, no, but close to zero. So, so could it be greater than 100%? No, it can't be better than the best, and the best is a perfect emitter, and that would be uh, back to the pure Stefan Boltzmann law. Okay, but this is a property of the surface, the surface, all right, and that allows us to get the rate at which the emission of photons off of a surface, okay. As soon as you have photons coming off of this surface, you have another surface over there, photons, then you have an exchange. I don't want to go there yet. This is the first lecture. We're just doing only the emission, not the return from other surfaces. Okay. Let's talk about values for the emissivity. Hey, why didn't they put up here what the units are? Well, it's dimensionless. And they have a description of aluminum. They say it could be polished or oxidized, or copper could be polished or oxidized. Maybe you have a lot of experience with some copper. Anybody worked with a plumber? You have brand new copper tubing? And maybe you see some copper tubing that's been out there in practice for a while or in the back of a truck for a while or wherever, and it don't look the same. And they often have to rub it and clean it up before they join it together and, and uh, solder it. So anyway, this is a big difference, isn't it? It's kind of like uh, my bank account balance and, you know, the president of the university's bank account balance, you know? <laughs> right? It's a huge difference. Just think about it. There's a big difference between these numbers. Look at them, 0.02 and 0.6. That's a big, big difference. So right away, you got to know the emissivity if you're going to do a good job of accurately to a, a, a high degree of confidence or small uncertainty pre radiative predictions because the property emissivity often ranges a lot. Okay. And then same with aluminum. That's a pretty good, that's a factor of three, isn't it? This was a factor of what? Oh, I got to figure that out. What is that, 30? That's a factor of 30. That's huge. Likewise, uh, cast iron, uh, stainless steel, and that it goes with your experience. You can go out there and polish something, and it changes the perception. by You, you look at it, it's it polished versus highly oxidized. If you have uh, things like wood, sand, concrete, you just do the nominal value and maybe not as big of a range. Metals can be polished or, or oxidized, but they still have a lot of variability. It's like, what sand are we talking about? There's a lot of different sands. So the next thing I want to talk about, we had an introduction to conduction, convection, radiation with the properties and rate equations. Now we just want to tie it into the previous class that you mastered. If somebody said from memory, write the first law of thermodynamics for a closed system undergoing a process, you can do it. Maybe not under the stress of this class and me walking around, looking over your shoulder, saying, where are you at? Come on, get it, cough it up. But you'd write out something like the change in the energy of the system is equal to the amount, the heat that was transferred in during the process minus the work that went out. 
And so you're accustomed to this big Q. What does it stand for? Heat transfer. Typical units. Joules or kilojoules. Somebody says, uh, don't, we'll skip this one. Give me the first law for a control volume, and that's a rate equation. Well, you'd say something like, yeah, I had this, and I had a little M dot coming in, and a little M dot going out, exiting. I think it was something like the rate of change of energy in the control volume with respect to time is equal to the rate at which it pours in by the heat transfer minus the way it comes out across the boundary of that control volume in the form typically of shaft work. And then you had the mass flow rate, and you had then the enthalpy, and the specific kinetic and specific kinetic potential energy, all of that in and in. And then you had, hey, it's a minus what's exiting, enthalpy, kinetic, and potential, uh, can't write today, kinetic energy and potential energy uh, exiting. Does that look reasonable? So you're accustomed to something like this. Well, you're in a new class now with a new book. And so... In your old previous class, we just talked about what Q is and what Q dot is. Uh, Q double prime? Nah, I don't think it was used. Don't think it was used. How about Q dot, lowercase? No, wasn't used. If you used the lowercase Q, it was something like Q over M or Q dot over M dot, and it had joules or kilojoules per kilogram. So these three you are familiar with coming from another class. New class, this class, sometimes notation can be confusing. We make big deal out of lowercase q without a dot, and that's our rate of heat transfer in units of watts. If you had to say, well, what was that in this other class? That was that one. But don't try and make, just be clear of what the terms are and how you're using them. We uh, use also the flux. We don't use this one. And we make very little use of this one, but we will. And we'll make a little use of that one, but these are the two big ones. Okay. Hopefully it puts it in context. So in review, conduction, convection, radiation, there's a lot more. We only briefly talked about what comes from the surface of the sun over here. Uh, we didn't really talk about the electromagnetic spectrum where you have visible light, ultraviolet light, infrared light. We will when we get to that section. It do a good job of surface to surface, meaning my photons go and hit you, your other surface. Your surface photons are going to come back and hit me. It's kind of uh, reciprocity, photons exchange, etc. Ooh, in order to ha have a heat transfer, there must be a temperature difference, or can you have a heat transfer with no temperature difference? It must. You must have a temperature difference. Qu another question. In order to have heat transfer, there must be a liquid, a solid, or a gas, some material, in order for the heat to transfer through. Which of the three modes can go in a vacuum? See? Your UTSA, you're paying your tuition, you're getting something out of it. <laughs> K, thermal conductivity is our standard symbol. And what are the units? Watts per meter degree C. What's our standard symbol for the convection coefficient? H, very similar units for H and K. Watts per meter squared degree C. And when you have radiation, it's a proportionality constant. How good is it compared to the perfect emitting surface, the black body? It's our emissivity, it's dimensionless, and it can only be between 100% and zero. Thank you for your attention. We'll see you later.